Hello and welcome everyone to our webinar today, The Risks and Potentials of Content, Why Content Governance is a Must for Every Enterprise. Content Governance, um, heavy word, um, and maybe not everyone has heard about that uh, before, but it's a critical component uh, to the success of your enterprise content strategy. However, 82% of businesses feel they don't have the right technology in place to manage their content and to take care of content governance. Technology is pivotal to bring your strategy to life and govern your content across its entire life cycle. So um, in this webinar today, uh, we will learn about how AM guides, the experience measure guides and acrolinks use content governance to holistically address some of the, today's most complex content challenges. And with me in the room is uh, Volker Smith. So my name is Stefan Gens. I'm the senior worldwide evangelist for Adobe Technical Communication, and I'm with Adobe since more than seven years. Meanwhile, and I um, know AM Guides from the very beginning uh, when it, when we released it in 2016, and uh, since then, the, um, our Data CMS AM Guides has developed massively. For a long time, it was called XML Documentation for Adobe Experience Manager, and today it's called AM Guides, as you learned probably at the last Data World, where Volker Smith was also our very appreciated guest. And uh, with this, uh, let me welcome Volker Smith, and uh, the stage is all yours, Volker. Thank you, Stefan, and thank you for the possibility and the opportunity to speak today um, together with you. And uh, yeah, let me spend probably 30 minutes talking about content governance and the various aspects of it, and probably more about the business case that drives it. And then hopefully we have some time to go into Q&A. So let's talk about the risks and the potentials of content and why content governance is a must for every enterprise. Uh, for sure, you know the, uh, um, the company Adobe. Acolinks is a Berlin-based company headquartered in Berlin, um, but with global customers. We have more than 200 customers around the globe um, that have invested into content governance in the meantime uh, for a number of reasons that I will outline in the next uh, 30 minutes. Um, we have an organization in Germany, obviously, engineering based in Germany, um, and then sales service and marketing um, deployed around the world. Yeah, this company is built by scientists with love for language. so. Years ago, um, we have been created as a company, as a spin-off from the German Association for Artificial Intelligence, probably long before artificial intelligence and natural language processing uh, has become a business term. Um, so the inception of the foundation was initially more to provide services around NLP and AI, but more and more the company has transitioned into providing a SaaS platform to our clients, uh, in many, many cases connected to the entire state of the Adobe platform to create success for clients. Um, founded 2002, about 175 Acolinks as by now, we are more than 200, so it's a bit of an old slide. Busy in 15 countries, more than 200 uh, enterprises being our clients. And that's our vision, and that always creates a little bit of provocative uh, conversation. We would like to help to create a world connected by amazing content. And uh, it creates a, uh, um, a conversation with prospects and clients always because many people believe that they have already amazing content, but the question becomes, how do you measure that? And how do you make the best effort to create an even better customer experience over time? And why does it matter in the first place? So let's talk a little bit about impactful content, what that means. Um, and this is setting the stage for content governance a little bit. So I will probably go down a little bit deep. And so please follow me on that one. So first statement is what enterprises write and how they write it matters. And um, while we live in the world of 2022, and if I give you a few numbers, by now we have about 1.7 billion commercial websites deployed around the world. And the Google index 
um, scans and crawls about 80 billion pages every three months to recreate the Google index. So the content, the digital content supply chain is at a stage that it overlooks 80 billion pages around the world. So it has become probably the major means of the interaction between a brand or its products and services and its target audience. And this is sometimes overlooked, and this is why really the content that enterprises write or produce and publish really matters, because it is in the world where we, 8 billion people, interact mostly via content with brands, products, and services today, which clearly has not been the case 20 years ago. And when we consume content, all of us, and when we struggle understanding the content or making meaningful outcome out of it, the enterprises start to struggle with their content. And this is where content governance normally comes into play. So in our mind and what we try to promote is that we think that impactful content results in measurably improved business outcomes. Content needs to be looked at as an asset of the company. And let, if you think about an asset of the company, let's assume an enterprise has disseminated about a million pages on, on a website. And that's not uncommon. Some enterprises have a lot, lot more pages disseminated on a, on a website. And let's just assume that the creation cost of each single page can vary from $450 all the way up to more than $5,000 for long-form content. If you do the calculation, the, creation, the created content has become one of the main assets of the company, even in sheer dollars, because a million pages calculated with an average of $1,000 is a lot of investment that has been done over time, which doesn't show up on the balance sheet, which does normally doesn't show up on the PNL either, but there's a lot of sunk cost in content. That's the one thing, it's cost aspect and what, but what the content does for the enterprise, what the impact of the content is, is a complete other aspect. So let's talk about a moment of, yeah, does it matter for an enterprise and how can I make that, why does it matter visible? This is one of our clients, and so it's a real customer use case. I don't want to mention the name of the client, but what is interesting is if I look at some of the core data is that this client has about 7 million pages on a subdomain. So that's not even the main domain of the company. It's the subdomain. This is 7 million web pages, all technical content. This is to help existing clients or people that want to become clients in the day to day work to use the, the products and services and their relative challenges. So these 7 million pages attract 1.2 billion visitors per year on the subdomain. That's a lot of traffic on the subdomain to begin with. But if you look at the engagement, the engagement on average is about four minutes and 50 seconds. So each visitor would spend four minutes and 50 seconds engaging and reading and trying to understand content. That gives you a total of 5.4 billion minutes of people engaging with the brand, its products and services every year. And that's the moment where you provide a lot of proof why what enterprises write matters in today's world. If this for 5.4 billion minutes you do the math and the calculation is probably the major interaction between the brand, its products and services, and its target audiences every year. And it has become even clearer during the time of pandemic where physical events or virtual events um, have been reduced. And it clearly became a big matter for them to make these 5.4 billion minutes a positive experience when people read content. And I think we all know here on this call today what it means if you do a Google search, you end up on a page, you start reading the page, 
and you have a compromised experience reading the page. You cannot understand uh, what the page is talking about. It's too complex. Uh, it's using the wrong terminology and so on and so forth. This is why these 5.4 billion minutes matter. Clearly the case here is you've got to find out as an enterprise what is the degree of positive user experience reading content and what is the degree of neutral to negative um, experience reading the content. And if the majority of these billions of minutes is neutral or negative, it has a severe impact on the business outcome of the enterprise. And this is why we firmly believe the interaction between the brand via content really and clearly matters for this specific enterprise. So let's go from the helicopter view now to a more down to earth, the view on a single page or a single document. Sometimes it's a page, sometimes it's a long form document and look at some of the economics that are related to this page or long form content. So in this case, it's a diagnostic ultrasound uh, user service manual. Uh, it's a very, very long form content. It's a structured content. Um, it's a lot of work being put into it before it's being released. You can easily imagine that a lot of people would look at it clearly from a usability, but also from a compliance perspective. So the creation cost, and that's always hard to estimate, but on average on such a long form content, it's easily more than 10K that, that an enterprise would spend to create this content. So there's clearly a question, can we improve the efficiency of the creation cost over time? Because more and more content needs to be created or changed over time. Uh, product life cycle shortens and there's a lot of demand for creating new and revised content. So the creation cost is one aspect. But the other aspect is what if the content is being published, what is the interaction on this specific page access and usage is 13,000 monthly views to the Knowledge Hub. So if you apply the Aqualinks platform to this specific page and you see the sidebar popping up here on the right side, um, we assess this document based on the needs of the specific enterprise or, div or division on correctness, on alignment, on terminology, clarity and tone, aspects like simplified technical English, a lot, a lot of aspects that can be defined for the enterprise. And if we apply this logic and service to this specific page, on this specific page, we find 231, we call it impact obstructions or things that can be improved to make the content better readable using the correct terminology or the best brand alignment. So fixing these 231 impact obstructions is probably the key step in the process of the content supply chain to improve the impact. Because the other aspect of this is product failure sums up to 9 million annual spend on product issues and failed installations and also the support overhead creates 231,000 cost on a monthly basis based on inbound tickets and calls. There's a clear correlation and causation between the quality of a piece of content and the resulting support and overhead cost. Minimizing the impact obstructions is one of the major aspects of a content governance um, cycle, process and system that need to be in place to improve the overall impact of, in this case, a single page. There's a second example. This is, we are now moving away from technical content and enter the space of more revenue generating content. Um, and this page here is a page from uh, the famous and well-known uh, site here in the US uh, called nerdwallet.com and this page talks about the best credit cards of September 2022. It's again a long-form content but the whole intent of this page is to create affiliate revenue streams. So 
So every click on one of the uh, credit card su uh, suppliers would probably result in a in, in a lead revenue for Nerd Wallet. And again, the same principle for content governance would apply to this one single page. So let's do the same cycle. The creation cost for this page is a lot, lot lower, probably $1,200 because of lot, a lot of the content on this page will come from the credit card suppliers. The other aspect here is a lot of explanation what a credit card is and uh, the best use cases and so on and so forth written by Nerd Wallet. So in this case, Nerd Wallet spends about $290,000 every month on Google Ads to create traffic, to initiate traffic for this page. That is a lot of spend for one single page, so a lot of investment. That's the push side. On the pull side, the to total amount of keywords on this page and the search volume per keyword in initiate a pull or a demand for this type of page of 30 million monthly Google searches in the US for this kind of page. Both push and pull create an engagement of 453,000 visits on this page on every single month. And clearly the intent is that this page visit in the interest of Nerd Wallet should create a click on one of the credit cards being supplied here on this page and that would then result into revenue for Nerd Wallet. So it's all about the conversion of the traffic into a revenue generating item. We do it again, check on alignment check on terminology and check on clarity and tone on this one single page, again applying the Aqualinks platform against it, you would find 355 impact obstructions. So again, the aspect of content governance becomes look at the impact obstructions, improve the quality of the content over time relative to the various aspects. And with that, you don't necessarily increase the engagement. What you do is you increase the likelihood of a conversion to a click and with that, the possible revenue stream for a single page of content. The so content governance clearly has a connection to business outcome for an enterprise, but the use case can really vary. The technical documentation that I just showed you earlier is one aspect. On a marketing page, the business impact is a different one. And the third one, when we're not going to a lot more detail would be a compliance case. There's also a case to be made that you need to check content on potential risks. Um, risk can be legal risk. Um, if you have a wrong formulated technical documentation that can cause in some cases severe uh, legal implications. Um, or if you use compromised language or non-inclusive language on what you write, it can create indirect damage by creating um, a negative impression on brand and services, and in some cases even create on social media something that would normally be described as, as a shitstorm. So content governance and its aspects can be very broad and be applied to various aspects of, of the content that is available but it's a definite need for every enterprise to have. And then there is this global battle for content touch points. So content is in competition with other content that is out there. And I mentioned earlier that the global uh, supply of websites today is 1.7 billion websites, more or less, or 80 billion pages. Enterprises today spend $521 billion annual for global digital ads to create engagement with content. Google made an Amazon account for 64% of this ad revenue. And on top of this, on the push side, about 105 billion emails, B2B and B2B, B2C emails are sent every day to create, again, engagement with content. And on the pull side, we count about 5.6 billion Google searches per day. That's us searching for content, and people spend about 152 minutes per day on social media apps where there's, again, a potential interaction 
uh, with content. So the dynamics and the competition of content has dramatically increased in the last 10, 15 years uh, by the evolving aspects of the internet. Yeah, to sum this part up, impactful content, it's sometimes good to get our heads out of what we think is relevant and important. And I found a piece here that I wanted to share with you from Accenture. Uh, they've published a research report a few years ago. Uh, it was summarizing that content has become the H2O of marketing, basically the water or the essential for living uh, for an enterprise. Um, uh, Donna Tuff, not anymore with X Accenture, has created this research report. You can find it on the internet. And uh, there's, there's a lot of good hints and, and, and views and viewpoints on what I just described, probably from a different angle, but with the same outcome. As I said, sometimes it's good to have an external reference of what we believe is important or not important. So highly recommended to read that piece. So how do we achieve impactful content through governance now? So what is it that we need to do if we work for an enterprise in the content supply chain and would like to help to improve that? As I said earlier, what enterprises write, or in other words say, and how they say it really matters. There's a number of aspects that need to be improved, checked on, and then improved. The clarity of content, the tone of the content. Um, I'll give you one example on, on tone is, as the enterprise a definition whether you want to have a formal or informal language in your content. And just to have that definition is one thing, but then to check the existing content whether it's formal or informal is a complete other aspect. And again, if you have a million pages disseminated, you cannot do it manually. So you need to have an engine in the background to identify gaps relative to tone. Inclusivity, the third aspect, has become more and more prominent, specifically in the US and in many other places. Um, there's even a board demanded um, activity making sure that the language that the enterprise uses is an inclusive language. And again, same example, if you have a million pages, if you want to check whether the, all these pages are inclusive or not, let alone the internal communication, but just the external one, you got to have an engine and a platform that allows you to check the current status, identify gaps and problems, and then help the organization to improve over time. Words and phrases, consistency in the use of, of the defined terminology of an organization, scannability, readability, and other aspects. And last but not least, probably the one that has been transitioned into commodity already is correctness, spelling, and grammar. So all these aspects need to be checked on your pool of content, and the pool of content can be massive. And um, we are never, we are colleagues are never surprised if we start to engage with enterprises. You might think, well, content is everything that resides on the CMS, but we normally identify probably between 50 and more than 200 different repositories that has enterprise, that has enterprise content in various formats. You have to make sure that in your content supply chain, you can cover all these different aspects of content repositories and different authoring systems. Um, there are authoring systems uh, for XML content or component content. Um, authoring systems can be Microsoft Word, uh, can be Google Docs or many, many others. And all these authoring systems and authoring environments need to be supported. And the business outcome of the content and its various impact aspects is customer experience. The quality content is aligned to your brand. You improve customer experience, acquisition, and retention. Second aspect is performance. You have a chance to improve on traffic and engagement and conversion and revenue. That was the example of the marketing piece. Content governance re results in a reduced risk of your existing uh, content. 
you avoid fines, legal fines, and the avoidance of non-exclusive language, as I mentioned earlier, can avoid severe brand damage, citing from shitstorms. And then last but not least, content governance also improves the efficiency of the content creation cycle. If you have in your core language, maybe English or German or other languages, if you have a governed piece of content at the very beginning that is optimized relative to the goals that you have set, all the resulting translation costs will, re will be reduced. That's one aspect. You will see a call deflection um, in your uh, support cost, and you will improve your time to market. All of this are business outcomes from an efficient use and uh, deployment of content governance. And then, the as much as we want to have the content supply chain defined once in an enterprise, the current reality is that there is a lot of different content supply chains that exist. There's a content supply chain in technical documentation and a customer support in IT and operations in legal human resources training, marketing, and corporate communication. There's not one single content supply chain normally, but various aspects of it. But with content governance, you need to be able and have to be able to embrace and make use of these different content supply chain platforms, repositories, authoring systems, and workflow systems in your enterprise. And the required capabilities, as I said, you need to support the enterprise authoring systems with all its complexity. You need to provide automation. And that means you need to tie content governance into the repositories that holds and contains the current content to establish a baseline of quality. And with that baseline, best support the authoring environment. You need to have content quality analytics that is connected to your entire state of content to make sure that the improvement of content over time results in better business outcome. And that then results in content performance analytics. And that's the opportunity where you can plug existing quantitative data, may it come from Google Analytics, Adobe Analytics, or other places, may it come from your marketing automation platform, or from your support cost to tie the quality of content with the resulting business outcome in the post-publishing world. Yeah. That's a winning combination. These are two logos. One is better known than the other ones, I have to admit. So there's the Adobe logo and the Acolinks logo. And I think the combination of these two enterprise-grade platforms create a winning combination uh, for an enterprise out there. We will give a few examples of that. Uh, but many of the customers um, that we serve are existing Adobe class customers, and the integration needs to get Adobe integrated into Acolinks or Acolinks integrated into Adobe creates additional um, benefits and outcome for each enterprise. And so this is our degree of integration into the Acolinks, uh, into the Adobe world. It is on the creation side, the Adobe FrameMaker, the Adobe InDesign, Adobe InCopy, and I think the latest addition to the uh, Adobe world of products on the creation side, Figma, has just been acquired where we also have a tight integration to this part of the creation or authoring environment. And on the experience side, Adobe Workfront, Adobe Experience Manager, and Adobe uh, Guides. Um, so Acrolanes can never be seen as a standalone system in an enterprise. It needs to be integrated into the existing world of authoring system or the creation side and the experience side, which is normally backend, the repository that holds it, and the workflow system that supports an enterprise to make efficient use of it. So let's talk about one example. It's really not a tech talk example, but sometimes it's good to look at the regulation aspects of content governance, because that normally triggers a lot the speed and the dynamics in an enterprise to establish content governance. Acolinks and Adobe um, support a leading UK retail bank for the new consumer duty regulation. It's a regulation that has been put in place this year. Um, 
to measure retail banks in the quality of content that they provide to their consumers. They have specific requirements around clarity and consistency and the ease of use of the content. And it needs to be measured and the retail banks have to prove that they have sufficient processes and service and data available to prove to the authorities that they do do content governance. So it supports the consumer understanding around clarity, scannability, and consistency. Um, provision of analytics to provide insight around these aspects. And then enable the FCA with proof of efforts on compliance to make sure that the bank is in a safe, in a safe place. And here again, this is a case where the Aqualinks platform and the Adobe platform work together as one to best support this leading uh, UK retail bank in their efforts to, be, uh, to become compliance relative to the new consumer duty regulation. And so um, AEM, AEM guides, Workfront, and the authoring environments and the Aqualinks platform as one solution uh, will support this bank and hopefully other banks in the UK over time uh, to comply with the regulation. So this is an example where you have external regulation driving content governance. Um, that's also the case in pharmaceutical and medical equipment. Um, but sometimes it's the sheer business pressure internally that drives the case, the business case for content governance. That was it. I think, Stefan, I kept the 30 minutes. Uh, if you have yeah, more well, questions. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Short and yes. um, Yeah, um, uh, there's one one thing that really um, uh, catched my attention, and that was the number that you were giving. And the number was 521 billion US dollar. Yeah. Um, that was the number, um, if I remember correctly, the annual global digital advertising spend. Correct. And when I think about that number and when I think about uh, the size of tech doc departments and knowledge creator, uh, creators and their budgets um, and even learning content creators, that is probably just a small fraction of that. Um, and if you think about that, that only a small amount of money um, goes into the content creation process and um, enriching the content and making sure that the content is in the right voice and tone, and that it uh, complies to uh, corporate standards, etc., and terminology, etc., um, and then a multi, 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 multiple amount uh, of that is going into uh, marketing this content, mm -hmm. um, and that is for me is clear disbalance <laughs> where I say, "Wow, um, this can't be true." That um, Companies are not aware um, that they are spending so much money for marketing the content, but only mm -hmm. so few money on creating this content. And uh, maybe they could even save a lot of money on uh, on, the, um, on marketing the content if the content would be better um, out of the box um, and would fit yeah, better to, uh, messaging, etc. I think that's a good observation, Stefan. And uh, let's not kid ourselves. It's a lot easier to spend marketing dollars, Google AdWords or Display or what have you, because enabling and deploying content governance is probably not easy, I think. It's needed, but not easy. Um, but I would agree that sometimes spending probably a few less dollars on the marketing side and more dollars on process and organization to make sure that your content is in the best possible shape before you spend the marketing dollars, that's probably a wise decision. Yes, absolutely. I would like to also hear from the audience a little bit. Maybe you can put it in the chat, a few comments. Uh, what is your experience in your companies? Um, do, the comp do you feel that your company is spending enough money into content authoring and content creation? Um, in terms of budget, uh, headcount, uh, tools, technologies, etc. So uh, please put your comments in the chat. I would be uh, curious to see how it, how it is with your company. Um, and one other question I have, Volker. Um, I have conversations at conference booths, uh, etc. Um, many times, and people are asking me about um, possibilities uh, to check their content. 
And usually I mentioned that there are um, dedicated professional solutions for that, like Acrolinks, mm -hmm. who perfectly plug into uh, AM Guides, for example, mm -hmm. and other Adobe solutions. And then sometimes people come up with that sentence, oh, that's that grammar checker, isn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's much more, of course. Uh, maybe you can give a few words, um, tell us a little bit um, that what Acrolinks uh, can do with the content and that it's much more than a spell checker or a grammar checker. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point, Stefan. Thanks for asking the question. There, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, tools readily available to do spelling and grammar checking. It's out of the box in Microsoft Word. It's out of the box in Google Docs. You can provision Grammarly or others. But the thing is, the enterprise first has to decide what are the goals and objectives they have for their, for their content. What are the style guides that they want to apply? What is the defined terminology? And how do you measure it against the enterprise rules? These are all aspects of a content governance platform that are not aspects of a simple spelling and grammar checker, I would say. A spelling and grammar checker is always designed to help a user, which is absolutely fantastic and nice. But to help a user doesn't necessarily mean it helps the enterprise. I'll give you one example. If you want, if you want, if you have defined that in your marketing language that you want to deploy for your product and your brand, you want to use informal language. It's a definition that the enterprise has to make, and that triggers then the language that you use in the in your content. And that is above and beyond grammar and spelling. And I think the differentiation between Acrolinks and the simple spelling and grammar checking is that we mo mostly support the enterprise to become better, while the spelling and grammar supports an individual to become better over time. But that's a complete different aspect. So can you also um, create your own corporate style guides and implement them into Acrolinks? Yeah. Yes, that's one of that's normally one of our onboarding efforts is to help companies to create that style guide. There are style guides out of the box, but there's normally also a a change requirement for the style guides before you put it into place. Um, and also, I mean, the terminology is needs to be defined by the enterprise. That's one of the aspects of Acrolinks is that you define your terminology and make it readily available for the entire authoring system. And another aspect of the Acrolinks platform is that we would also um, integrate into other backend data to make this data available for the authoring environment. I'll give you one example. There's a lot of talk about a search engine optimization platform. Um, and one of our objective is to tie back into the data pools for SEO platforms and make this data readily, readily available for the authoring environment. Sometimes it's not just about language. Language can be as simple as using the keywords that your users are finding. I have more questions, but we also get some questions from the audience, Volker. Okay. Um, one from Jenny in the private chat and uh, one from Helena in the Q&A. And, &A, and uh, there's, um, there's some questions in the chat itself. Um, if you have more questions, folks, please uh, put them in the, into the Q&A pod. That makes managing these questions more easy for us. Um, so let me start with the Q&A. Um, Helena was asking, the use case um, covered were primarily focused on headed content. Can you share a little bit about how governance can be applied to structured content mm -hmm. at the front or at the object level? Yeah, that's a great question. So I would agree. Um, it is one of our common use case to support structured content. Um, you can, I mean, if you look at the degree of integrations that we have for structured content editors on the front end, you can easily assume that we have a lot of use case supporting clients, both on the back end and the front end, to improve um, content governance on structured content, um, including the simple use case of re reusing existing content. Uh, where do you have objects or structured content available that you can reuse? So that's one of the common aspects that I have not talked about in, in this presentation, but it is part of our content governance structure. Yeah. And you can also see that in the implementations with um, a Adobe Framemaker, um, yeah. where you can author a structured content like Dida, 
um, or other structured um, authoring formats, and Acrolinks plugs into FrameMaker with a sidebar and um, is checking that structure content as, as well. And the same happens also in the web editor, uh, the Jitter web editor for Adobe Express Measure Guides, where Acrolinks, the Acrolinks sidebar also checks the structured content there. I hope mm -hmm. that answers your question, uh, Helena. And uh, then there was a question coming in from Jenny. Uh, we spend a lot of time uh, and effort on revision of content. How can your tools help with managing document maintenance throughout the life cycle of the product? This is a technical documentation question. Yeah, that's a great question. So in the world of content, let's first agree um, there's a lot of content out there. I mean, within an enterprise, but globally, there's more content available that we all can consume over time. So for the revision of content, one of the major steps that we support is you have to set the priorities of where do you want to start. Again, if you have a million pages somewhere, or even it's just 10,000 pages, it's hard to find where, he, where you should start. So that is the whole concept of establishing a baseline of your existing quality of the content. And baseline means we would scan the entire estate of content against your goals. Goals around clarity, consistency, tone of voice, inclusivity. And we would score every piece of content relative to your goals. So that establishes the view on you should normally start where you have the lowest degree of quality or the lowest accruing score connected with the highest degree of demand. So if you have high demanding pages or pages with a lot of page views and interaction and a low score, that would put in the workflow that we provide all these pieces of content into priority one for revision. And I think that is very helpful in content governance is instead of trying to boil the ocean, you need to put structure into the process where to start, how to start and why you would start in certain um, aspects of your content. So prioritization is a big aspect of content governance. Hope that answers the question. And with that combination, Jenny, of Acrolinks and Adobe Experience Manager guides, for example, um, you have the checking um, and you have the versioning. Uh, so you can uh, also version the content and um, create uh, your base version, then um, create a second uh, one, like 1 1.0, then create 1.1 with the content checked by Acrolinks, and then create 1.2 for approval, etc. So you have these uh, combination possibilities of uh, both the CCMS and uh, this content governance solution. We're using that at, uh, within Adobe even uh, as well. Um, then we have a question from Hope. Um, as a technical writer, I have found there's little understanding of the content creation process of the clients we have and limitations on the content creation process and tools we have made available to us. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. That's true. But even more so, I would say, not in contrast, but in addition to these statements is there's even less understanding about the impact of the content. Sometimes technical content is viewed as, oh, I must have technical content because it's just one of the aspects before we can release a product, we must have content. Um, but that completely overlooks what is the impact of this content. It's probably at the same level than the product itself. And think about the concept, how much quality assurance anybody would put into the product but how much quality assurance and governance you put into the related content. So I think, yes, there's little knowledge about the tool and the creation process, but there's even less knowledge and understanding about the possible impact and ramification that compromised content can have in the product lifecycle overall. Good. Um... And Scott is commenting, uh, they have a style guide team who keep the guide constantly updated. Um, Scott, is that um, a separate style guide uh, that you have uh, living on the shelf somewhere, um, like a PDF or something? Um, or is it a style guide where that is technology-wise implemented, where technology is checking the content if 
the content is following the style guide, or is it the human being that has to follow this? That would be interesting to see in the comment. Um, and there's a comment from Leslie Gors. Um, our yeah. team creates the content easily. Where we struggle is attaching value to the existing content due to lack of content tagging. Is this something you can help with? I think I need to better understand what content tagging means. Um, I guess it's a metadata question. Yeah. Maybe if I get you right, um, like a, in an asset management system, you have your content and you want to automatically uh, tag legacy content. That is something you can do with AM guides. Mm -hmm. um, I guess it's not so much the responsibility of Acrolinks to do that, um, although the linguistic intelligence within Acrolinks might be able to help with that. Yes, metadata tagging. Okay. Um, so um, that's something you can do in AM guides where um, you can uh, bulk tag um, um, legacy content or use APIs to uh, tag the content, um, or even Adobe Sensei uh, can help you with that, uh, the AI engine from Adobe to tag content. Yeah. Okay, um, and um, maybe, maybe back to Scott's question, maybe a hint here. Um, uh, I, I know that a lot of companies have existing style guides um, in a Word document or a PDF document. I think one of the aspects of content governance is to create a digital environment for your style guide. So make the style guide part of the solution. And what we Aqualinks do is we would, we would include the style guide into our target setting for the enterprise and with that make the aspects of the style guide available to the authoring environment, uh, not by the means of PDF or Word document, but when we check content, we check it on consistency against the existing style guide. And that is the difference between uh, the, the digital distribution of the style guides, whether an Aqualinks targets uh, deployment or whether you have written it in PDF and would hope that the authoring environment would, would read it and apply to it. Right. That's, that's um, Volker, that's exactly uh, the same thing with terminology. Yeah. Um, for example, in translation processes. Um, a lot of companies share an Excel sheet with their terminology to the translators. Mm -hmm. And the translator starts translating in whatever, Trada, Studio, or MemoQ, or whatever it might be, or Eclink, uh, and across, or MSource, whatever. And then they suddenly encounter a word where they say, oh, this could be a term. Then they go to the Excel sheet, look it up there, don't find it, maybe this term is not defined. They do this two or three times and um, maybe sometimes they find one and then one point the translator says, you know what, forget it. Uh, I, I never look into this Excel sheet again. I just translate my content down and uh, use my own terminology on that. And that is exactly the situation with the style guide as well. Um, people have a hard time to manage two things, uh, ha having a separated technology-wise separated style guide or technology-wise separated terminology list or so, it needs to be integrated in the authoring environment. Yeah. Um, and whenever you write something, it gets flagged um, automatically. Um, you, like Trader Studio does it with a um, terminology integration for the translation uh, part of the content lifecycle. As soon as it's directly integrated in the editing environment, it suddenly becomes useful. When it's living its own separate life in a document repository somewhere uh, on the shelf, um, many many times authors do not really use that style guide, um, and that's that's a big challenge uh, of these disconnected technologies there. Yeah. I, I completely agree, and, and what I said earlier, Stefan, that I know many enterprises that have a style guide written in Word or PDF. Uh, as you said, most of these enterprises also have a style guide written in Excel that is yeah. being distributed or shared via SharePoint or other uh, other means. But the question is, can you really make sure that the style guide is being applied or your terminology requirements are being applied, and how do you check it and make it part of a consistent process? It's a complete difference. For that, you need content governance and a platform like Aqualinks to combine. And with that, you increase the automation and the measurement around this process a lot. Yeah. Um, Hope, um, you, uh, thanks for your comment on um, a one-on-one -on -one meeting with experts. Um, feel free to uh, click yes in the poll. 
um, or reach out to us at techcom.adobe.com. Uh, we would be happy to connect with you on a one-on-one -on -one basis and uh, discuss that. Um, there's a plus one from Helena on metadata governance need. It would be amazing if the tool could scan for keywords that are mapped to taxonomy metadata to flag potential issues with tagging. Yeah, I think this is something we can help you with, uh, Helena. So uh, feel free to reach out to us or click yes uh, in the poll, and then we can uh, uh, connect with you. And there's one there's more. The, from Stefan, I think there's another question from Wanda. Um, Oh, I didn't see that one. In, uh, in the Q&A, do you have an app? Oh, right, yeah. Sorry, Wanda, I uh, missed that. <laughs> yeah, education is just a whole other aspect of, uh, of content governance. And yes, we have use cases around it. Talk about medical education. Um, you also can talk about generic education. Um, uh, there are specific style guides for language that you need to use to make uh, learning content available for, for different last grades. Uh, I don't know what the U.S. terms in, in general is, but yes, we have a lot of use cases around educational content, and some of them are even internal educational content. Uh, we have one use case uh, sitting at one of our clients that governs the education content that uh, that an enterprise has with 360,000 employees for the onboarding process. What do you do on your first day when you come to this enterprise? How do you get your laptop? How do you get your applications installed? And that in the context of uh, seven different languages. So that's, I think, a good use case of, um, of educational content, specifically around collaboration. Good. Um, there's one comment from Joe in the chat that I would like to take a little bit further um, with you, Volker. Mm -hmm. um, it was about the relationship between creation costs and uh, marketing costs. Um, and let me take Joe's question one level ahead. How does, in your, your experience, uh, Volker, with uh, enterprises, how difficult is it to convince companies that um, they need to spend more on the content creation and content governance side? And um, uh, because that very often that is the small piece in the, in the <laughs> as we saw in your presentation as well, the smaller piece, uh, and that doesn't get the uh, necessary attention maybe. Mm. And um, what is your experience from conversations with uh, CEO, CMOs, um, etc.? Yeah, that's a great question, and I think the um, the answer back to this is you need to have a degree of innovation spirit in marketing organizations to come to the conclusion that a better balance between investments into the creation, investments into the content supply chain in general, and content governance in balance with the marketing spend creates better outcome for enterprises. It requires modern thinking. It requires an organization that has deep knowledge about the correlation between marketing spent and the expected outcome of it in a multi-attribution world. And so I would, I would put some of the companies that we talk to into this innovation camp. They want to innovate. They know that there is pressure on the marketing spend and they start to invest to improve the tooling that they have on the platform side to improve the quality of the content to be able to improve the outcome of the of the content. But there's still a degree of enterprises where I think innovation still needs to kind of being invoked <laughs> to some degree. And um, but that's just a matter of time, I think. It becomes clearer and clearer that I think some years ago somebody said the highest, the highest cost or the, the most prominent customer for the IT or uh, for the IT enterprises will be the chief marketing officer. She or he will be the biggest spender for IT to just be able to improve the whole tooling around what you need to do to do marketing. In the old world of marketing, it was as simple as let's create a TV spot and let's put it on the Super Bowl event. Yeah, That's right. what they did. But in today's world, 
8 billion people connected to the internet, conducting 5.6 billion searches every day on the pull side, you need to be a lot smarter than that, I believe. I completely agree with that. Yeah, okay, good. Um, if you have one more minute or two more minutes, and um, Helena was um, coming back to her original question um, about structured content and uh, said that we answered her question to a degree. Um, but uh, she was actually looking to understand if the scoring that you mentioned is applied at the reused fragment level or on the objects. Um, well, Helena, that's... yeah. Go that's ahead, an Volker. expert question, Helena. I think I'm, I need to go into the organization to find an answer for this. I, I simply, at this stage, I have to admit, that's something I don't know. But we do have these experts, so reach out to me. Yeah, so that I was going to to say the same, Helena. Um, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, Volker Zime is also there at the um, at the screen share, uh, and techcom.adobe.com is our email address, so you can reach out to us as well. And then we can also uh, check on content and reuse fragments, etc., and uh, how this can be handled with acronyms uh, in combination. Good. And with that, we are pretty much at the full hour. Uh, we had a long chat after uh, the presentation, almost half an hour. Um, thanks for taking this additional time, Volker. Mm -hmm. um, many thanks. And uh, I hope you all enjoyed the session. And with that, I will stop the recording and uh, say goodbye. Thank you, Stefan, once again for the opportunity. And then happy holidays to everybody here on the call. Hope to be in touch soon. Thanks. <laughs>